course Evolution of the Earth and Life. Today we are going to talk about the beginning of the universe and how do we know what we know. So there are different ways of learning about the things that happened long back in time and we are going to talk about a few of them. How do we know what we know? So when it comes to the beginning of the planet or the solar system or the universe, there are various ways we can try to understand what happened in the long past when we were not observing it. And one important part of it is our theoretical understanding. Some of the observation also helps. For example, planets in the solar system all rotate around the sun in the same direction on the same orbital plane. These are kind of the indications that all of them formed simultaneously probably from the single disk. Sun is a star. This is part of a galaxy similar to other stars and therefore we can also infer that the formation is similar to the formation of other stars. And now if we observe what the other stars are showing us that will give us some information how the sun has behaved in the early phase. Now in order to discover the early stage we can study the stages of formation of stars and other planets and we can also use some of the basic physical laws that are obeyed by the large objects as well as small objects. And these would tell us some general ideas of how everything can start. Now one point to note is often the things that have happened in the long past can still be observed. Now I will give you an example and how it can happen. Now if the sun rays are reaching the earth right now, it means that it is telling us what happened in the sun 8 minutes and 19 seconds ago. Now let us stretch it to the stars where it takes let us say 1 year for the light to travel from that star to the earth. That means if we are recording something about the star's light that is telling us the events which took place one year ago. And there are stars which are millions of light years away and that means that whatever we are recording right now they are telling us about events that took place long long ago. Now how do we know the distance of the star from the earth? One way of observing it or calculating it is the method is using the method of triangulation where you can observe the angle of the sun that is making with a specific point on the earth and then after a different after some point of time so let us say you took a measurement in January and then once the earth has moved a um, substantial distance you again take the measurement at some different times and the angle that it creates of the same star just by measuring uh, the angle at two different times of the year that will tell us about the angle and if you know the angle and these positions that will tell you something about the distance of the star from the earth. And once you know the distance then you can also talk about how long would it take for the light to travel and if you know that that also tells you that what you are recording at looking at the star's light, what is the age of that event. And these are extremely helpful when we try to understand something about the very early history of the universe itself or the formation of the solar system. So the stars which are dying today let us say and therefore has a bright light 
that light although we are receiving today and we are saying that it is a light from a dying star, it actually happened, it could have happened much much long ago. We are simply receiving it today because of the distance from the star. These theoretical uh, studies as well as uh, observations of the stars, far distant stars tell us a lot about the initial development of the stars, the galaxies and our solar system. Another source of information comes from uh, extraterrestrial bodies such as comets and meteorites. Comets are frozen leftovers from the formation of the solar system and they are composed of dust, rock and ice. They range from a few miles to tens of miles and they orbit close to sun and when they come close to the sun, they heat up and spew gases and dust into a glowing head that can be larger than a planet and the materials also form a tail that can stretch over millions of miles and that is what we see when we look at the comet and the uh, tail at the back. Uh, Halley's comet we have heard of, this has a, a periodicity of 76 years where we can see it every 76 years and these kind of materials tell us something about the volatiles and the behavior of materials uh, at the early phase of the solar system when they are condensing. Now apart from the comets, there is another body of extraterrestrial material um, that we called meteorites. Earth has undergone continuous erosion and plate tectonic movement and therefore it is highly unlikely to find the rocks that date back to Earth's origin. When we think about the old rocks from the earth, it actually goes through the cycle of subduction and therefore melts. Once it melts, it basically loses all its record of the past history um, because it melts and then resurfaces and forms another rock. That rock will only count the age of the, from the last phase of uh, melting and crystallization. So, it is not going to record the earlier history. As a result, it is very unlikely that we get complete rocks from the very origin of the earth. That information comes from the meteorites. Meteorites are solid particles and when they enter earth's atmosphere, uh, because of the friction, they start to burn and it burns creating a streak of light and they represent the primitive material of the solar system. Now, majority of the meteorites when they come to the earth's atmosphere because they burn only a small fragment of it ends up on the earth's surface. For many of them, uh, none of these will end up because the entire thing will be burnt. But using these array of meteorites uh, that have landed on the earth's surface over the millions of years, we can really understand something about how the initial formed materials, rocks looked like, what was the chemical composition like um, in the early phase of the solar system. So, there are different types of meteorites. One is stony meteorite which is of rocky composition. There is another type which is called iron meteorite. It is made up of pure iron, it has a metallic composition. Another quite interesting type of meteorite is stony iron meteorite which has a mixture of rocky and metallic composition. This has often been said a good proxy of the core composition as we know that it is not possible to reach the core of the earth today, but it can tell us some, it can give us some idea, these stony iron meteorites can give us some idea that what the core composition might be. Because if 
we look at the overall composition and if we know what is the crustal composition of the rock today in the earth, then we can calculate what is remaining there and what might have been there um, at the deepest part of the earth. It also tells us something about the age because most of those meteorites date around 4.6 billion years ago and that tells us something about the availability of these rocky materials around 4.6 billion years ago in the solar system. A very important source of information in understanding the history of the solar system as well as uh, the early phase of development of planets comes from the lunar rocks. There has been six landings between 1969 to 1972 as part of the Apollo mission where the astronauts landed on the moon and they mapped, photographed, collected samples from the surface of the moon. And all of these are extremely valuable information to understand the early history of the earth because the moon and the earth share similar location with respect to the sun and they have similar history in terms of the formation. As a result, we can use moon in terms of understanding the early earth's history. Another important point of the observation of moon is that there are a high number of craters which people observed even before going to the moon. A high resolution photograph of the moon shows that on the lunar surface there are large craters and small craters and the overall frequency of craters are much much more than when we look at the earth's surface. And one of the reason for that is as we know that earth's surface has been modifying, getting modified regularly through the work of uh, weathering and plate tectonics. And both of these factors play a big role in obliterating some of these records. Now, if we study the craters of the moon that tells us something about the record that probably earth also had, but uh, got obliterated because of the action of weathering as well as uh, plate uh, movement, uh, weathering plus e ocean. Now, before going there, um, people started observing that the frequency of large and small craters are not really the same on the moon surface. In fact, there are two distinct types. There are places in the moon which are called highlands of the moon. These are relatively high topographic region where people have found relatively more traces of large craters. On the other hand, there is a relatively low lying region which is called a maria and that shows mostly relatively smaller craters. Now, the question is why? Using the idea of relative dating of different um, surfaces, the researcher came up with a interesting method using the criteria of relative dating of different surfaces, uh, people came up with the uh, concept of crater counting for the moon. The way crater counting works is you count the number of craters, but you also characterize them into big and small and that tells you something about the age. Now, let me explain it. The crater counting primarily uh, depends on these three very simple ideas. Number one is craters are absent on the new surfaces and older surfaces have more craters. This is relatively easy to understand that if a surface has been there for longer, it will have more craters. So, the frequency of craters 
are telling you something about the age of the surface. If a surface just formed, um, it is younger and therefore did not experience that many impact events and therefore it will have small number of craters or no craters at all and an older surface will have more craters basically saying that different uh, longer the time the chances of getting hit is higher and therefore it will have overall high frequency of craters. So, if we have to draw a plot it will be the crater frequency and the age. So, the higher the frequency is the longer it has been there. So, there is a, a positive correlation between age and crater frequency. It does not end there. There is another point that you can use in terms of whether the craters are small or big. Now, the impacts are, are not of the same frequency. What we see even in today's earth and uh, the movement of the meteorites in the sky, we know that rarely do we get large impacts. It is mostly the small bodies often they come into the atmosphere and burn out nothing reaches the top of the earth. So, these are small impacts they are much more frequent. On the other hand if we are talking about large meteorite impacting that is very rare event. Now, which surface will have more chances of catching this rare event? It will be the surface that stayed there for longer. The longer it is, it will have more chances of encountering such rare events. So, therefore, we can say that if we find the frequency of high large impacts or large craters, uh, those indicate that the surface has been there for longer. So, this would be an old thing. But if we find that there is low abundance of large craters, then it is an young thing or young surface. That is the second point. And the third point is, if you find two craters, one small and one large, it tells you something about the relative time. So, let us say you find in the field uh, of the moon uh, that there is a large crater and then there is a small crater which looks like this. This tells you using the geological principle of cross cutting relationship that this small crater actually cross cuts the boundary of the uh, large crater and therefore, the large crater happened before and the small crater happened after. So, the small crater is relatively young and the large crater is relatively old. Using all of these criteria of crater counting, um, researchers came up with a very good understanding of how craters are distributed on the face of the moon and what does it tell us in terms of the age. What is found is that the highlands have the highest uh, frequency of the large craters in comparison to Maria and the conclusion was that highlands are the older parts whereas, Maria is relatively the younger part. Not only that because we know that earth and moon has shared history as well as we are finding all these large craters, it also tells us that there was a phase during their history where it was being impacted by these uh, large meteorites in a relatively more frequent way uh, than what we see today. The third thing that we understand is because their history are shared between earth and moon, earth also must have gone through these phases of really high frequency of bombardment and they are called these heavy bombardment and that must have reshaped the uh, surface of the earth that we see today. Another important aspect that we should understand and it goes back to the origin of the universe about what we can observe. 
Now, when we observe the lights or any wave, uh, in fact, we can think of the sound wave, we know about a particular phenomena. For example, if we are standing in a rail station and the rail, um, the train goes by, depending on whether it is approaching uh, us, the observer or going away from us, the sound of this rail uh, sounds quite different and that is because the wavelengths are changing, the, therefore the frequency is also changing. Now, whether it is coming closer to us or going away from us finally dictates what kind of change there is going to be. Similar thing happens for the lights, the light waves also. As it turns out that if the light source is moving away uh, from the observer, then there is a specific type of change in the spectra and if it is coming closer to the observer, then um, it shows an opposite type of shift in the spectra. The first one is called a red shift where the spectra actually shows um, a difference in the wavelength and it is sort of like a stretching of the wavelength, an increase in the wavelength and that is what is called a red shift. Now, people started watching different stars of the galaxy and uh, different galaxies and what they found is that the galaxies or the wavelengths that are measured are quite different from what was expected. And that is when people realize that there is, has been a shift and that shift actually indicates an increase in the wavelength or a red shift. The red shift of a dif distant galaxy is measured by comparing its spectrum with a reference laboratory spectrum. Atomic emission and absorption lines occur at known, well known uh, wavelengths and by measuring the location of these lines in the astronomical spectrum, astronomers can determine the shift. So, in other words, they can see whether it is actually shifting to show the increase in the wavelength or decrease in the wavelength. And as it turns out, if you look at the galaxies, it is actually showing you an increase in the wavelength or a red shift. Now, why that might be? Now, one possibility is that just like using the analogy of the Doppler shift that the observer is moving away or the thing is moving away from the observer. But as it turns out that if you look at different galaxies, you basically look at the same thing and you find the same signal, which means that all the galaxies are basically going away from each other. And that is where uh, the idea came that if you think about the galaxies of today, they are basically going away from each other. As a result, we are finding the stretching of the wavelength or red shift. Now, an obvious question comes that if they are always going away from each other, what might have happened back in time? So, if we can somehow rewind this same process, what we will find that if we can go back in time, we would have found lesser distance between all of these galaxies. Now, if we rewind some more, eventually we can think of a situation where all of these things were centered into a single point. Exactly what happened before that we really know, do not know. And that is where we are going to stop because beyond that we really do not have any understanding of how it happened before that. But probably the point where we can think of that everything was centered around the same place we cannot even use the word place because it indicates something about a space which was not there because you are uh, concentrating everything. And there must have been the point where the time and the space started. And that is the whole idea of how the universe started. Um, it is one of the 
topics of active research, but this is a general understanding that we have at this point. And just by looking at how far back you have to go in order to have that point and what happened after that, it indicates this um, phenomena called Big Bang beyond which you start to see this expansion of the universe and beyond which we really do not know or before which we really do not know. And that happened around 15 billion years ago. So, that is all we understand about the beginning, the very beginning. Now, once the universe started, um, a diffuse roughly spherical slowly rotating nebula contracts under the force of gravity. So, now we are talking about a relatively specific area and a flat rapidly rotating disk forms with the matter that will become the proto sun concentrated in the center because it is rotating. So, it will have slight uh, difference in terms of what kind of material you are finding at the center versus what are the things which are at the outside. Now, the enveloping disk of gas and dust accelerates and accretes into kilometer size chunk. These are called planetesimals and basically uh, everything whichever centered at the central point that is what creates this proto star uh, for our case it is the proto sun. And finally, once these uh, things which are planetesimals they collide with each other they can form a planet like shape. So, the terrestrial planets build up through the collision of the planetesimals and the giant outer planets uh, mostly form from the gases. But still it is not quite clear at this point that how can you create these different things. So, we are going to talk a little bit about how the elements were formed because we know that the sun it has a lot of hydrogen and helium. How about the other elements that we find so commonly in the planets as well as the inner planets as well as the planets which are far away from the sun. How did we create all of these elements? As it turns out that once the sun forms the different elements also started to come. The hydrogen cloud collapses and it gives off heat uh, probably we are talking about million degrees of temperature um, and atmospheric pressure. Now, the heat aids a new reaction which is called nuclear fission. So, this nuclear fusion basically uh, keeps the sun going, it also adds heat to it. Under these extreme conditions, the nuclei of two hydrogen atom collide with such force that the neutrons are transferred from one nucleus to another and making some hydrogen atom more massive than the others. Helium forms when two protons that are less massive than the original hydrogen atoms they convert to basically helium, but the lost mass converts to heat energy and that means it adds to more fusion reaction. With increasing temperature because of more fusion reaction the other elements of the periodic table will start to form. So, the elements from the beginning starting from hydrogen, helium, uh, lithium, beryllium, we come down up to this point which is iron and all of these can be formed by this fusion reaction. Things start to change once the iron is formed. Every fusion reaction till iron releases energy and therefore, it aids to more fusion reaction so that new things can form. But iron has the lowest energy of any atomic nucleus. The formation of elements beyond the mass of 56 which is the mass of iron consumes energy. So, therefore, this process um, is that 
of neutron capture and it involves absorption of neutrons by the atomic nucleus. It can only be formed if the environment is already it has already energy and it can add to this uh, formation. So, the regular fusion nuclear fusion cannot create this because eventually it is not adding any more energy so that the nuclear fusion can go on. And therefore, it can only be formed in a highly energetic environment within a star such as the one found in supernova explosion because only in this environment the sufficient energy is released to allow the energy inefficient process of heavy element formation otherwise it will not form. Now, the moment it starts to do that this disrupts the balance between two forces operating in a star. One force is the gravity which pulls towards the center and then the nuclear reactions pushes the mass outside and that sort of keeps the balance. Now, the moment uh, there is a cessation of the outward push because there is no uh, nuclear reaction taking place gravity starts to take over and because of the gravity uh, this leads to the collapse of the entire star. It leads to an explosion of supernova where the star is ripped apart blasting most of its mass outwards and that is when we start finding the development of relatively heavier elements which are beyond iron. So, the elements that are formed before iron and the elements that are formed after iron have a very different history of their formation. Now, in summary today we tried to understand the very early phase of development of elements um, as a result of different forces acting in the universe. We also focused on what are the different ways we can try to understand very early history of our universe, the solar system and the planet. We learnt about the theoretical understanding, a bit of astronomy, how do we know and observe the moon record, meteorites and comets. We also understood how the craters in the moon can tell us a lot about our earth's history and how to interpret the craters in terms of age. Finally, we understood a little bit about how the solar system might have started starting from a rotating uh, nebular disk and then converting into a separated areas of uh, proto sun and the other areas of planets. We also learned how different elements before uh, iron in the periodic table and things that form that appears after iron in the periodic table have very different history of formation. Here are some of the resources that I used for making the slides. Here is a question for you to think about. Thank you.